passage this morning will be John chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. Again, John chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, that we may die with him. Father, we gather in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ this morning, and we are thankful that he is the resurrection and the life. We thank you for the gift of God that is in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the redemption that we enjoy. And Father, may we be be strengthened in that joy today as we've gathered in your name. Father, help my voice to hold out May I speak with clarity for your honor and the upbuilding of the saints. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. The title for the sermon this morning is Life and Death, the Resurrection of Lazarus, and Jesus' display of himself as the resurrection and the life. I like time travel movies. How many of you guys like time travel? I want to see hands on this one. There we go. Yeah, everybody likes time travel. Miss Shannon. What? I'm disappointed. One of my favorite is Back to the Future. The cheese in it is just right. All right? In October 21st, 2015 is like, that's the time that in the second movie they went back to the future, right? And so in that movie, the hoverboard like the self-drying coat, the self-tying shoes. I mean, they had all these things. Uh, you know, they had like next-level EVs for vehicles, you know, electric vehicles. They, they had floating vehicles, and I mean, everybody was like a pilot, essentially, right? And in 2015, October 21st, right, the memes on the Internet went nuts. Why? Because we have none of that. We have none of that. All right, let, let's go to a different time travel movie for you Star Trackies, right? And the, the people that got offended by the way I said that, we know you're genuine Star Trekkies, right? I don't know if you remember when they came back to like 1985 and Spock was complaining about like how terrible the medicine was and how the technology was so much further behind. And, you know, he'd come up and give a medical exam with this little thing, and go, you know, and... and and all of a sudden make them all better, right? You know, and then teleporting here and teleporting there. That's what I'm waiting for. Forget back to the future. I want to like go and like show up in another room, right? You see, 
we think that in those movies, that eventually in time, we will reach this point of technological advancement that is just like off the chain. It's very exciting, very cool stuff. But like, have we really gotten that advanced? Have we moved in that direction? One of the theories that suggests that we should be is the doubling of information theory. The theory is, is that every time information doubles, we become you know, twice as good, twice as knowledgeable, twice as capable as human beings. And so back in the 1900s, about every 100 years, information would double. And then in 1945, it was every 25 years, information would double. And I could go down the chain, but you really want to know where it's at now. Every 12 hours, every 12 hours, information doubles. And if every 12 hours information doubles, don't you think we would have handled the coronavirus better? I mean, I'm just, I'm asking. Like, I just, I'm curious. Don't you think we would have handled fill in the blank, whatever it is, better? Don't you think our solar energy would be better? Don't you think our EVs, our electric vehicles, would be, well, like, more than just a large phone? Because that's all I've done is stuck wheels on our phones. Has anybody else thought that? I have, repeatedly. They just stuck tires to the phone and made the batteries bigger. Great, now I can drive around in my phone. Other than the screens, other than the electric vehicles, what technological advances are there? Well, I've, I've actually been very curious, and I've started asking this question. Okay, are we as advanced as we say? Why, why has Star Trek, the movie, not become a reality? And I was reading my neurology stuff, and, and I got somehow into, like, space travel. The places I read are weird. Do you know that we are slavishly connected to fossil fuels for travel within the space because you need displacement of mass to actually move anything in a vacuum? Yeah, yeah, did you follow that? We have to have gas to move in space, and the whole thing that Star Trek does doesn't work, actually. It doesn't actually have any sort of mass displacement. And you're like, well, we're actually going to travel on Rosenstein's Bridge, right, where they, like, fold time in and around on itself, and then you go through. It's Thor, basically. We're going to travel like Thor. And yet, that's theoretical. It's not real. We actually, aside from our screens and our ability to communicate in a myriad of different ways, we actually haven't advanced that far medically. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of the things that we can do are amazing. Absolutely amazing. I want to say praise God for the gifts of medical advance and medication and things like that. Right? It's mind-blowing. They stuck a radioactive disc in my father-in-law's eye to help with the cancer that he has, the melanoma that's in his eye. Pretty cool. And he walks around with his pirate eye patch on, you know, his lead eye patch on so he doesn't give his wife radiation poisoning. That's amazing that we can figure that stuff out. Yeah, his, his, his lead pirate patch. But really, how, how advanced are we? Well, the doubling of information theory doesn't make me think that we're actually that advanced compared to what it should be, especially when I'm sitting in the neurologist's office and his response is, yeah, you got a brain and it's not broken. Well, what does that mean? He goes, well, that's all we got. We can look at pictures and go, yep, it's there. And it doesn't look like there's any big holes in it. Good job, buddy. So what do we do now? And he's like, eh. these are like cutting edge, like they're like the doctor of the doctors, right? And yet they know very little about our brain. Until the last 15 to 20 years, they actually equated our brain to a machine. And this machine kind of worked like a computer, except for the fact it doesn't. It doesn't work like that. It is actually a plastic, highly complex neural set of connections that can be wired and rewired, and it does all kinds of weird things in the way it chooses to wire. And they don't understand it near as well as they think they do. Like, he asked me all kinds of questions about what and how and when and where. And do you guys realize I had a three and a half inch fracture on the side of my skull that still gives me a lump here? And the fact that I have the neuromotor control that I possess, they're just like, yep, with some people, they would have killed them. And for you, I don't know. You got a thick skull? Well, everybody knew that beforehand. <laughs> it's the only thing to get a name in today. That's hilarious. Right? They, I mean, beyond, they're just like shrugging their head and being like, I don't know. 
where we've actually had a funeral a few years back for somebody that fell out of a car doing 20 miles an hour, about the same speed that I was going on my bike, and they died. We're not as advanced as we think we are. We're not as far along as we think we are. How fast do you think it would take us to be put back into the Stone Age? I think it would be pretty quickly. When you actually study the technological advances that ancient Egypt had, and you think about them being one of the most advanced societies in the history of the world, what happened to them? They're, they're under sand. With, with, with hieroglyphics and, and, and tombs as the best report of what they had. Why do I bring this up? How does it connect? Because I could rant on this all day. How does it connect? It connects because our pride blinds us. We think we are so enlightened. We think we are so smart. We think we are so able. We think that we are able to put these things together and understand what is so that when we have something that we don't necessarily understand, our own arrogance and pride keeps us from seeing what is there. It could be as a civilization. It could be as a nation. It could be as a town. It could be as an individual. It could be as a, a religion. But the fact is, is pride becomes a blinding reality when we think we are greater than we actually are. When we become more impressed with our own intellectual acumen than anything else. When we start making statements about ourselves regarding, well, I, I usually see things pretty clearly. Well, do you really? Well, I think I do. I think I see things pretty clearly. I think I have an understanding of reality. But as I grow and I age and we move down the road of hopefully increasing humility, you begin to understand what you don't know. The old adage is absolutely true that you hear the old timer say. The more information we gain does not make us therefore more knowledgeable or smarter. There's actually very little that we know. And in humility, we should come to God's Word trying to understand it rather than letting it blind us. Understanding who is the Creator, who is the Maker, who is the Owner. Reminds me of a joke between the scientists and God. You guys have probably heard this joke, but I'm going to tell it anyway. There was this scientific group that basically said, God, we, we've gotten to the point where we're so advanced we don't need you any longer. And he's like, okay, that's great. Why is that? Well, we actually have the keys to life. We, we can create just like the Creator. And he goes, well, uh, I'd like to see about that. And they're like, okay, what do you propose? Well, I will create man, and I will do this, and then, then you create man because you've got all this cloning and stuff, and you can figure it out, and you're so smart. You know, it's just wonderful. So God creates a man out of the dust. And then the scientists are like, all right, our turn. That's pretty good, God. Good job. You know, it's impressive. And so they start to go creating their own man. And he goes, wait, 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 wait. Get your own dirt. It's not terribly funny, but it's poignant in that. You can't use my stuff, man. Why? Because it's all his anyways. And anything that we think that we do that is creative like him is really just by the fact that we're created in his image. You see, being overly convinced of our own ability is a detriment to us and it blinds us. I think that is what happens here in the time of Jesus with the Jews, with anybody that disbelieved. You have this story of Lazarus. It's an amazing story. It, it is a transitional story into the upper room discourse and the Passion Week of Christ where we get to in chapter 13. It is a transition from the ministry, the earthly ministry of Christ, to a, like a, a poignant and pinnacle display that he is the resurrection and the life. This is what he's been arguing the entire time. He has the authority to give life and to take life. He has the authority to take somebody that went into the grave and take them out of the grave. This is the authority of Christ. He not only does it, he does something greater than they even criticize. What do they say? If you'd have been here a couple of days ago, because he waited four days until he came. He waited two days until he came. It was four days total from the time that Lazarus went into the grave. And they basically like, if you were here, 
you know, a guy that's done all these miracles, he could have saved this man and kept him from dying, right? No, he let him actually start stinking. So it wasn't just, a, oh, he swooned and then he revived him. No, he let decay and actual death set in. And then what did he do? He spoke and out he came. And then what was the response of the people? Well, we'll get into that next week, but the response basically was they wanted to kill him even more. They're like, all right, we can't have any of this. And in the last week or so of his life, what do they do? They are sick in the plot of wanting to destroy him. When they actually saw something greater than what they even critically anticipated. And all I could get caught on this week is like, you guys got more than you even asked for. And yet still they reject it in their pride. In their thinking they see things as they are. I'm overly going to say this again at the end, but I'm going to say it now. As we come through this story and I point these pieces out and we go verse to verse all the way through to the end where he basically says, take the bindings off Lazarus. I want us to begin to think in our own hearts and minds how maybe potentially our pride has blinded us blinded us individually, corporately even, as a nation, as a people, to not be able to see the work of God in our life, to, to not grasp fully, joyfully the glory of God manifest in the face of Jesus Christ. I, I ask myself that same question all week long. I'm going to ask it again here of myself. I'm asking you to ask it too. May we not be like those who see this amazing thing and yet go, hmm, I'm not impressed. There should have been more flames or something. I don't know. Should have been more sparkly. Had fireworks along with it, Jesus. Rather than being unimpressed in our pride, let us rejoice and praise God as we see that He is the resurrection and the life. 11.1 Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be, may be glorified in it. So he's basically saying it's, there, there's not going to be final death. Yes, death comes to him, but not in a final and absolute sense right here and now. And there's a purpose behind this. There's a purpose behind what happened to Lazarus. It is for God's glory. Amen. So my question as I went through this is how much of the death that we suffer, how much of the destruction and difficulty that we suffer is actually also for God's glory? All of it. All of it. How many of you sitting in here right now are struggling with difficulty? Who is not? Just stand up. Well, that hurt. It was difficult. Gravity was pulling down on me heavily. Right? That's just a simple, small, momentary example. The reality is, is there is a hurt in everybody's heart. There's difficulty everywhere. And what does God intend that for? God works things, all things, all things together for good, for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Christian, do you see the goodness of God in your pain? This is what this story is about right here. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. What does the immediate assumption of love have here? Oh, you need to get on it. Let's go. Hurry up. Hurry up. You need to take care of this right now. But because he loved them, he waited. That is a counterintuitive thing, is it not? Because of the love of Christ for them, he waited. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going again? Stop. 
It is potential that his disciples thought his staying back behind was maybe a cowardly move. They, they are wanting to kill him there. They're wanting to stone him there. They're wanting to put him to death there. That is something he said multiple times. It's not my time. And he's avoided it. He's gone off to other places to get away from it. And yet now his time has come. He willingly goes into it and they're like confused. What, why are we going? They don't, they don't get what's going on. Jesus answered them though. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he is... He does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But, but if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now Jesus says some mysterious things. Is this a critique? Is this just a, well, it's today and the sun is out and we need to get going. Well, typically it's more than that. It's, it's not just a matter of, hey, the sun is out. But as he is the light of the world that we've gone over multiple times, as he is the one that is going to be coming into the world, bringing light into the world, he is wanting them to see this. Now's the time. Twelve hours in a day. Time to get to work. Now is the time. What has he said repeatedly? It's not my time yet. It's not my time yet. It's not my time yet. But now is the time. If anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. He wants them to see him to be who he is. After these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I gotta go to awaken him. Now, that phrase, fall asleep, you'll see that they don't immediately get it. They're like, oh, he took a nap. Well, no, it can be used and has been used in extent manuscripts and other places within the Bible to mean he died however they didn't quite get it because they were again a little dense not quite fully comprehending what is going on the disciple said to him lord if he has fallen asleep he will recover now jesus had spoken of his death but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep then jesus told them plainly lazarus has died and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. And I'm sorry, but I love Thomas. Nobody else likes Thomas because he's a doubter, right? He's a doubting Thomas. Thomas may have been a guy that I went hunting with, right? He might as well be me. Because there's often a denseness that comes with just not, not always thinking in the right spot. He's, man, he seems to have good intent. All right, we're going to go die with him as well. Onward we go into the light. Thomas, you don't get it, bro. And what I love about it is Jesus is still patient with the Thomases. Right? Even though I am a Thomas, even though many of us are Thomases, even though we, we don't get it, he is patient with us. He, he teaches. That's actually one of the things that I've been rebuked in, in a ton over the years is my impatience as a father. I am impatient as a dad. Why did you not get this yesterday? I've taught you this 87,000 times. Get it. How much more is our Savior patient with us? How many more times does He have to teach us? And yet with a Thomas, He is patient. I mean, patient all the way even unto the end where he, he comes to him and he comes to him and, and says, you know, see my, my hands in my side. Put your fingers in it. Touch it. And he, Thomas was like, no, I'm good. Took him a little bit, but he saw it. By God's grace, may we be like Thomas and see it even though we at times be dense. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Now, whether this is professional mourners, whether this is opponents of Jesus, because they knew that they were close to this family, have no idea whether it's just the pastoral function of the, the leaders in the village, they are still there. They're consoling them. So, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. 
But Mary remained seated in the house. Very typical to other stories about them and their personalities. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. It's an amazing response because I don't believe it's a rebuke. It's not written in a rebuking tone. It wasn't, well, if you would have been here, he'd still be alive. It wasn't that kind of snark that she was casting on him. I think it was a simple statement of faith, right? I, I know that if you'd have been here, he'd be alive. But I also know that whatever your will is now will also be good. How would it be to have the faith like that? I want this kind of faith. That I can look at a situation and I can see in that situation the hand of God in the middle of all of it and trust His goodness. To actually trust that God works together all things for good. And say, Lord, I trust You in this. I trust You for what's going on here. I trust You for Your goodness that I know that You are mighty. And that whatever You ask from God, God will give. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. This is a, another statement of faith. Yeah, I know. That's actually the hope. That, that's the eschatological expectation for Christians is that on the last day we will rise. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Now that's a little bit difficult to get because we think about the resurrection as an event that happens. But he's saying not just that there is going to be an event, but that he is the event. He is the one that gives the life. He is the resurrection. He is the life-giving one. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So, In other words, how many of us are going to see the grave? Probably all of us, unless the Lord comes back right now. Or sometime in the future. The fact is, is that we're probably going to see death, many of us. And yet, there's the promise of that resurrection. And yet, Jesus is the life we can trust Him for. That whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Again, even though we see the grave, what is the promise to be raised from that grave? This is why we grieve as those who have hope. This is why death is not the, the final scene. This is why when we lose ones who we know know Jesus, we can be what? Comforted. Why? Because we will see them again. We will be with them again. Do you believe this? Now, Jesus asked her that, but I'm asking you that. Do you believe this? Here's the thing about belief, my friends. Belief is a fickle thing that very often is attached to emotion, and there's no way to really divest it from that emotion. So there might be moments where you don't. There might be times where you just don't feel like it. And that is where we have to, by God's grace, even in those moments of weeping and mourning, even in those moments of difficulty and strain, even in those moments of darkness, look to the light and rejoice in the one who is the resurrection and life. Look to that place and train our emotions. You know you can do that, right? You can take captive your thoughts and put them in subjection to Christ. You can count it all joy, brothers, when you fall into various trials. The Bible is replete with passages like that that give us the encouragement to head in the direction of in moments of deepest and darkest grief, asking ourselves, do we believe this about Jesus? Do we know Him to be the resurrection and life? Do we know Him to be the one that does the will of the Father? She said to Him, yes, Lord. I believe that You are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. What a gift, right? What a blessing. What strength is that to us to believe like she believed? Yes, I believe that you are the Christ, 
the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Promised Holy One. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she had heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. So, again, are these professional mourners? Are are these leaders? It's, It's very difficult to say. It's probably maybe a combination of both. Mary gets up to go see Jesus. Everybody gets up, kind of tails out with her. She says something similar. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Now let's stop right there. The English softens it. It may be better to say he was, forgive my language, he was pissed off. He was angry. He is the picture of a snorting horse. The word is actually used for like an indignant horse. It's like stomping its feet and giving a, hmm. We call it the raging bull in our house, right? The girls let this out. You're like, you hear it from another room. You're like, you know somebody's angry, right? What is going on in there? They were greatly troubled in spirit. Right? Jesus is actually angry at this. He is indignant, not because of Mary's weeping, but because of the weeping of the other Jews. Because of the weeping of the people around her. Again, it seems like they are professional mourners, but it really seems to fit with the ethos of the people at the time. They are doing this religious deed while their heart is actually far from God. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? All right, so everybody's crying and mourning, and yet you got a group of people kind of standing towards the back and murmuring. Unimpressed. Jesus wept for many things. This two word sentence in the Bible, the shortest sentence in the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus wept because of their unbelief. Jesus wept because of their fraud religion. Jesus wept. Because of the pain of death, Jesus wept, and they didn't understand. So, oh, see how he loved them? Yeah, but if you can open the eyes of a blind man, well, then what's going on here? So deeply moved again, Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, By this time there will be an odor, for he has been there four days. He's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you will always hear me. But I said this in order that the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. His hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is an amazing thing, my friends. This is an unprecedented reality. While Lazarus meets the grave again prior to the Second, you know, coming of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. The fact is, is that Jesus spoke, demonstrating his authority over life from death. 
Lazarus, come out. Every time I read that, it gives me goosebumps. Every time I read that, you see the one standing there in perfect and absolute control. Lazarus, come out. He just got, hey, he might stink. Jesus doesn't care. There, there's no magic trick. There, there's no shenanigan. There's nothing that mankind could do once man is starting to rot in the grave to somehow fake what happens here. This is a magnificent and amazing claim. And so when Jesus says that he is the resurrection and the life, he actually gives resurrection and life to Lazarus. He demonstrates and displays the very thing that he has been claiming for the entirety of the three years of his ministry here on earth. This is an amazing claim. And let me tell you, you don't believe that Jesus did this, you don't believe Jesus. You don't believe Jesus did this, you don't believe the Bible. Might as well throw the whole thing away. Sit on that for a few seconds, let that marinate. Let me say it again. You don't believe this, you don't believe the gospel. That's a hard one, right, my friends? That's a, that's a rough one to wrestle with. Why do I make such a pointed pressure on this? Because there's a statement that they made years ago, and it comes from this passage. I think it's called the Chicago Statement. Doc, help me out if I'm right in this. But they basically they wanted to know how much of the Bible is really the Bible. And so they started kind of breaking everything down. And after a few years of meeting together, you know what they came to? Well, it's the red letters. The red letters are the real Bible. The rest of it can be forgotten. And you're like, okay. So they start going, okay, which of the red letters really are the words of Jesus? And you know what they got to at the very end and then they had to dissolve because there was nothing else to criticize? Jesus wept is the only thing that was Jesus. And you're like, wait a second, wait a second. Jesus didn't say that. It was said about him. I thought it was only the red letters. And they're like, yeah, well, we're pretty sure that's the only thing that probably happened. Yeah, Jesus is crying over this right now. You tools. And somehow you still claim to be part of Christ and Christianity? That's intellectually dishonest at best. It's treacherous and evil at worst. The fact is, we're people of not just the Word, but we're people of what God has done and what Christ has done. And if we start to disbelieve portions and cast things aside and not have them carry the weight that they actually carry, the, the, the sweater starts to come undone super quick. And if you want to undo that sweater... You're going to be left with just some doily hanging around your neck that does nothing for you, does not keep you warm in the least. The fact is, is that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and when He speaks, He gives life. By Him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, whether visible or invisible. Whether thrones, dominions, powers, All things were created through Him and for Him. He is before all things. And in Him, all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the firstborn from the dead. And in Him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. This is our Savior. And it is by His blood that we have been redeemed and restored and renewed. Christian, are you following after that? Are you following after Him in that way? Are you holding on to the one that spoke and a man came out of the grave? Are you honoring Him as such? Or would you just like the tune that Kevin plays and really, you know, enjoy the way Miss Betsy plays the piano and, you know, just... Kind of like the way the seat cushions feel when you come in and, you know, really enjoy the joke that Johnson told earlier. That was the worst joke I've ever told, by the way. It was terrible. It's worse than any dad joke out there. 
If you're, <laughs> if you're keeping it. If you're showing up for the dad jokes, you're here for the wrong reasons. The fact is, when we gather, we're gathering around the one who is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we have life in His name. When we gather, we're gathering to be strengthened in the gospel. When we gather, we're gathering to build one another up with the gift that God has given us that I can use for the sake of each and every one of you, and you can use for the sake of each and every one of us. We've gathered to sing the praises of the one that said, Lazarus, come on out! And Lazarus came out! How much more should we trust God in the mundane realities? Lord, help me to deal with Monday. Lord, I trust in your goodness. And I know Monday is within your will. If you guys are Garfield fans, you get that just a little bit, right? He hates Monday. Monday is terrible, right? If you saw a young man's pajama pants that he was wearing on Wednesday night, he had, you know, his hated Monday Garfield pants on. The fact is, there's a lot of things that are very Monday like in our life that are we going to trust Jesus even for those mundane things? My hope and my prayer is that we do. My hope and my prayer is Doc comes up here, he plays his guitar, we sing songs. We praise them together. I pray that as you bring the dollar or the 50 cents that you have in your pocket to give to the rank, and you give it for the namesake of Christ as an act of worship. Trusting in Him and His goodness and His resurrecting power as the giver of life, as the resurrection and the life. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this morning that You've given us in Christ. I thank You that we can gather like we do and we can praise Your name together. We can rejoice in Your goodness and in Your might. And I pray that each and every one of us here this morning would hold fast to You who is the One that redeems and restores and renews, that saves. May we cling to our Savior together. Father, I pray for those that do not know You, not just informationally, not just from a knowledge standpoint, but from an actual relational relating following You. I pray for those that know You not. Open their eyes that they may see You. Grant them life in Your name. We thank You for this morning, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.